Hello and welcome to our webinar this evening. Um, this webinar is all about undergraduate study in the USA um, and we will be going through over the next hour a short introduction to uh, the process of um, identifying universities, of um, applying to those universities and also we'll talk some about financial aid. So just to let you know who I am, my name's Rowena. I'm one of the Education USA advisors um, at the Fulbright Commission in London. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm from the UK um, and uh, I grew up here in the UK um, and then had the most amazing opportunity to go and study in the USA. Um, I ended up in California. I'd never been to America before, um, but I went to the US um, and had this amazing experience of studying for my undergraduate degree at a US university. Uh, now um, I get the best job ever, which is helping other people in the UK understand how to study in the United States um, and how that process um, can work. Um, I'm one of uh, three advisors here in the UK um, and we as a, as a team are a part of a wider network of nearly 600 advisors across 400 centres all the way around the world. Um, Education USA is uh, an amazing network that offers free unbiased advice about how to study in the United States um, and we do that at graduate level, so postgrad we would call it in the UK uh, and also undergraduate level. Uh, so if your dream is to study in the US we're here to help and tonight we are going to go through some of those steps. So a lot of students often ask me well, why should I study in the US and we, we've talked to many many students along the way um, about some of those top reasons uh, why someone might, might choose to go and study at a US university uh, and here is what many British students uh, report. So the reasons that often they, they talk about are the opportunities to experience uh, the reputation and the variety of US universities. Uh, so many US universities are really well known all around the world for their expertise. Um, but also there's all sorts of universities in the US. There's four and a half thousand uh, universities offering undergraduate degrees. Uh, so lots and lots of choices. And each university has its own personality, its own uh, ethos, its own kind of vibe. Um, and students from the UK often really like finding a university that's going to be a really good fit for them. Another reason is the campus life. Uh, certainly in my experience, it was really being part of a really vibrant campus life. The opportunity to get involved in um, clubs and societies that I cared about, uh, but also to experience sports, to experience um, the opportunity to learn not only in the classroom, but also beyond the classroom. Uh, and American universities are really well known uh, for all those opportunities that they provide. Another really big reason UK students are often really interested in studying in the US uh, is the academic flexibility that a US undergraduate degree offers. So unlike here in the UK, where if we're applying to a UK university, uh, we need to know what course we want to do and then we'd apply to study that course. We would study that course for three years and then graduate. And um, in the US, the system works a bit differently. So when you apply to a US uh, university for an undergraduate degree, you don't need to know what you want to study when you apply. Uh, everybody goes in um, uh, to the first year and the expectation is that you will take a range of different classes. So even if you plan uh, that your um, you know, eventual degree will be in maths, um, you will still be expected to take uh, perhaps a history class or an art class or learn a language alongside whatever it is you decide to specialise in. And so for most students, those first two years will be taking that range of different classes before specialising their degree for the final two years of study. So that can be really exciting. Uh, maybe you are the kind of person who's been really frustrated if you've had to pick pick your subjects uh, for GCSEs or for your hires or for your A-levels. If that's you, uh, the US could be a really good fit. Or if you're the kind of person who knows what they want to study, but actually really enjoys a range of different topics, again, the US could be a really good fit for you. Another reason many British students choose uh, to have a look at US universities uh, can be around funding opportunities. Um, it's um, sometimes 
uh, less well known that there are lots of funding options out there um, and many British students uh, find uh, those funding options to help finance their studies and in some cases it becomes cheaper to study in the US than to study here in the UK. Another reason uh, lots of British students choose to look to the US for an undergraduate degree is around employment. So how do you stand out in a global marketplace? Uh, how do you get a job? Um, you know, all of that. And sometimes a US experience can make you stand out in an owner parlor CVs, uh, whether that's looking to work for a bit in the US, perhaps after you study doing an OPT visa or something like that or whether it's coming back to the UK um, and standing out amongst other UK graduates. And then finally, lots of UK students are really ex interested in experiencing um, a, a country that has some things that are very similar to us here in the UK and other things that are very different. The opportunity to go and have some adventures to explore and to learn more about the US and its people is a really attractive trait for many students. Okay, so what are those big differences between UK and US? Um, well, we've already talked about one of those, um, not having to know what you want to study and that expectation that you will study a broad range of subjects. But there are some other key differences too. So um, key differences include the duration. So we're an undergraduate degree by standard here in the UK um, is three years long. In the US, it is normally four years long. So you would be expected to study for four years and end up with a bachelor of science or a Bachelor of Arts, just like the same qualification we achieve here. So that's another big difference. Um, alongside that is the, um, the way that you apply to an American university. So unlike here, where you might be applying for, I know, the chemistry course at Bristol, you would be applying to the chemistry department um, and they would accept you onto the chemistry course because you're going in undecided um, or aware that you're going to be studying a range of different things, you're going to be applying to join that first year class. It's not applying to a particular department. And it also means that your application is not going to be read by just the chemistry um, admissions tutors. Instead, it's going to be read by admissions officers who are thinking about the whole range of students joining that university. And that does change the application process. And we'll talk about that a bit more later. It's America um, and universities uh, have a lot of freedom. Um, so what you'll find is that universities in the US, uh, there are no set fees, unlike here in the UK, um, and there are no set deadlines. So each university can set its own fees and each university can make its own deadlines up along the way. And, and then finally, um, I just want to flag if we have any budding lawyers or budding medics in the house, um, just to flag that law and medicine are two degrees that work a little bit differently in the US. Um, so you won't be able to find an undergraduate law degree um, and you won't be able to find an undergraduate medicine degree in the US. Both of these subjects are subjects that you take at graduate level, what we will call postgrad. Uh, that's where American students uh, take take those subjects. So if you are an American, you might take and you want to go into to be a lawyer, you might take a no political science or history as your undergraduate degree, then you go to law school for your graduate degree and be able to then qualify as a lawyer. So just to flag that you won't be able to find law or medicine degrees. Um, there is a route if you are interested in law uh, to the to studying in the US. If you are a UK citizen uh, and you're interested in medicine, um, and that's you know clinical medicine, um, you will find that Amer the path to being an American doctor is a long and quite expensive and quite difficult one. And I would just encourage you to look at the UK options available. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. Um, we'll have a whole time for questions at the end of this presentation. But if you do have any questions, feel free to pop into the Q&A box, add your question there, and I will be able to come back to that later on. So if we do have anyone who wants to ask questions about law and medicine, I'm happy to get into those in deeper in deeper at the end of the presentation. Okay, some other differences. Uh, I think it, uh, there's a quote that goes, um, America and the UK divided by a common language. Um, in the US and the UK, there are some terms that you will probably find 
uh, when you're looking at US university websites uh, that may seem quite unfamiliar. So just to help you out here, I've included some, uh, some of those differences. So in the US, someone might talk about high school and that's the expectation it's grades nine through 12. Um, we would know that in the UK as secondary school um, and what we would count in England and Wales as years 10 to 13. Or let me see, S3 through S6 in Scotland um, and years 11 through 14 in Northern Ireland. So if that's, that's, that's the kind of equivalent of grades 9 through 12. Also in the US, you'll find universities um, talk about themselves as colleges, universities. They even sometimes refer to themselves as schools or institutions. Uh, know that all of those four words mean the same thing. So we would call that a university. In the US, a college, if a university calls itself a college, it's the same thing as a university that we would know here. It's not like a further education college like we would know here. So word college, don't be put off by that. In the US, you'll find universities talking about classes um, or maybe even a course. We would know that as a module here in the UK. Um, and in the US, you'll find universities talking about majors and degree programs. And in the UK, we would call that course. So just knowing that you're going to fit, hit some unfamiliar terms and how those relate is really helpful uh, in this process. Hey, another question we get often is about timelines and how does, uh, what's the timeline for applying to study in the US? As a general rule, um, you're going to be doing the actual applying bit, making an application and applying uh, in the year before you plan to enter a US university. So for most people who are in England and Wales, that will be year 13. Um, for people in Scotland, it's normally S6 um, and Northern Ireland is year 14. So you will be applying to a US university before you plan on that year before you plan to start. Um, so here is a, an overview of a timeline. Um, what I would suggest uh, the ideal process for studying in the United States would be, to, the first thing is to be spending some time on research. We'll talk a bit more about why this is important in a moment. Um, and this can be happening before that magic year 13 point. Uh, so if you are, um, in year 12 or under, uh, researching universities is really, you can be really getting on with that and it will really pay dividends in this process. You can also, if you need to take them, take any admissions exams, we'll talk about those in a bit, um, but you can register and take those before you get to the year where you're applying and you can start to finalise what schools that you would, would be applying to as well. And then we go into that final year of high school, um, whatever that is in, uh, in the different nations that make up uh, the UK. Um, but as you go into that final year, in that probably that autumn time, you'll be putting together an application and submitting, um, and you'll put that application to the university um, and they will make a, an admissions decision. And so if you apply in the autumn, you normally hear uh, in the springtime um, and you would uh, apply for your visa if you've been admitted. Uh, we've got lots of pre-departure information on our website and you begin your studies. Uh, so if you are applying this year to start next summer, uh, that would be the kind of timeline that you would be looking at. Okay, moving on. So how do we go about choosing universities? So um, you'll remember I just said that um, there are four and a half thousand universities uh, in the US. Um, there are 120 universities here in the UK. So as British people looking at studying in the US, we're going to need to think um, a little bit differently about how we might find out about universities and how we might go about the process of researching universities. A lot of students that I work with in this process like to jump straight to the end of that actual application process, but US admissions works a little bit differently for undergraduate degrees. What you want to be doing is, is spending the time doing that research, finding universities uh, in order that when you actually come to the applying section, you can show the benefit of that research and hopefully increase your chances of admission um, and maybe gaining financial aid as well. So um, any time that you can put into researching and being open-minded about what universities you're looking for uh, will really help along this process. So 
you want to be aware that there are lots of different universities out there and they're all going to have really different um, things that they're good at. They're going to have different locations. They're going to have different um, personalities or vibes on campus. They're going to have different opportunities available. And you're going to want to spend that time researching in order to find a university that is going to be a good fit for what you're looking for. And um, so definitely spend some time being um, open-minded. Uh, lots of students that I work with uh, perhaps know five or six US universities. Um, and I'm sure if I asked all of you, um, I can almost predict what universities you might mention to me. Um, but again, four and a half thousand universities, it is impossible for everyone to know everything about all of those universities. So it's going to be really important to start to think open-mindedly um, about what universities are available. And I'll tell you, um, if you ask an American who lives in the US, who's just walking down the street, uh, if they can name some British universities, um, they will say, well, yes, Rowena, of course I can. I'm not going to pretend that I can do the accent, but yes, Rowena, of course I can. Um, I know the universities of Oxford. I know the University of Cambridge and I know the University of Oxbridge. Those are the three universities I know. Now, of course, Oxbridge isn't a real university, um, but the bigger point there is just that if you only looked at Oxford and Cambridge, you would miss all these other amazing universities. You would miss Bristol and you'd miss uh, LSE and you'd miss Edinburgh and you'd miss Queen's Belfast and you'd miss uh, Cardiff and you'd miss um, Loughborough and all these other amazing universities that the UK has to offer. So. Um, really make sure that you don't um, don't miss the universities available to you in the US just because you haven't heard of them. Another key point to think about in this point is to think about funding. So um, often I will be working with students, uh, again, looking at studying in the US and they'll get really interested in the university, but they might not have thought about what funding is available. Uh, to them to study at that university and so they apply and then they find out too late that there isn't funding available uh, if that's something that they need to help it make it happen. So um, if funding is an issue or a concern um, for you and your family then it's really important that that goes up into this choosing process and that you're thinking about at the beginning of this process. I'm going to talk more about funding and how that works in the US later but I just want to put a little as you know a great big highlighter here to just really encourage anyone um, to think about funding it should be a really important part of your choosing process and then the other thing you can think about is a UK backup plan uh, it's not uncommon for students I'm working with who might have uh, a real interest in uh, studying in the US um, but they also apply to UCAS at the same time you can absolutely do that US universities do not count towards your UCAS um, five choices. Um, and so you can run both processes up until the spring side by side so that you can make up, make your decisions. And I guess, especially with COVID, um, that's been a really useful um, approach for students to make. Okay, and so another big factor that you're gonna to need to think about as you're looking at US universities is this idea of fit. So each university has different um, personalities and different things and different that they offer, different opportunities, different specialisms, uh, different vibes. Uh, so too, each student is different um, and you will bring things to the classroom in a US university that the person sitting next to you won't be able to bring. So it's really important, this idea of fit. And the reason why this is also really important is because this um, directly influences admission. So if you're looking at um, competitive universities to get into, this idea of fit is going to be, need to be central to your uh, research process and central to the application process. You want to demonstrate why you would be an amazing student on their campus, and why you're a good fit for that university, and also how that university is a good fit for what you want to achieve from your education. Those two things go hand in hand. Um, and especially if you're looking at competitive uh, universities, um, this idea of fit is really central to the US admissions process. OK, so we've talked about a few things. So how do you go about finding these universities? How, how do you start this research process? 
So I'm going to um, show you now a, uh, a great way to kind of uh, get, find US universities um, and to search uh, for things that might be of interest. So you want to be narrowing down, you want to start broad, you want to explore lots of universities and, and then start to narrow your choices down to a list that you will end up ultimately applying to. Um, if it were me, I'd be keeping a spreadsheet, that's just how I roll, uh, something like Google Sheets, and you can keep track of your research as you go. Um, but whatever works for you, um, please do that. So this um, next I'm going to show you is this search engine. So um, this is something called Big Future College Search. Um, you can just type that into Google, it's called Big Future College Search. Um, and if you go into, type that into Google, um, and hit go on a desktop, you will open up something that looks a little bit like this. And it's basically a search engine um, for US universities. Um, there's about 4,000 or so universities in this database. Um, and it's a really useful way to start to find different universities. So as you can see um, on this particular example, um, we have 3,807 results right now. That's a lot of universities. Um, but what you can see is they're all listed here and you can go into each of these. There's a profile there um, and then links to their websites. But really helpfully down the side on the left, you have a range of different factors. So there may be things as you think about um, researching US universities that you're really looking for. So maybe you're looking for uh, a really large university with a big um, American football team, and you are really keen um, to be able to go and support that team. Uh, and on you know match day, uh, the whole stadium is filled with thousands upon thousands of people. Uh, if that is something that you're looking for, you can start to use these um, factors to help narrow down your search. Maybe you're looking for a smaller university, perhaps you're looking for a liberal arts college where you're going to have amazing opportunities to connect with professors um, and to be mentored by professors um, and to be able to create um, work that's worthy of being published even before you've finished your undergraduate degree. If that's you, you can also use these um, factors here to start to identify universities that will be a good fit. So I've just taken these screenshots to just show you how this works. At the moment, we've got this big long list. Um, but if you start to adjust your sliders here, um, you can see some of the factors that we've looked at. Um, you can start to see that you make very manageable lists to research instead. So here we've chosen things like a four year university. Uh, we're looking for medium sized. We've chosen to zoom in on Ohio here. Um, and we've actually said that it's really important that there is financial aid. Um, i.e. scholarships and so on available for international students. It's another factor that we've chosen. And instead it's brought us up 23 results um, for us to be able to have a look at. And there's big names here like Case Western Reserve University, uh, there's Denison, we can see Oberlin, we can see Ohio State, uh, lots of different universities in the state of Ohio to start exploring on their websites. So just imagine we went into Denison, this is the kind of thing you can see, and then you can see a big link to the Denison website. So you can start to like explore uh, in, in the university's uh, own website. Um, so we can talk about that um, perhaps a little bit later on about what you might find. But that's just a, a, an example of how you might go through this process. Um, it's a really useful process to go through when you're thinking about those universities. And what you want to do is spend time on the university website. Each university always will have pages about the academics, that's the stuff you'll study. Um, it will have pages about um, admissions, so how do you get into that university. There will be pages about financial aid available at that university, as well as all sorts of um, other pages that will tell you what that university cares about, what the students there are like, um, and so on. Another really good way to engage um, with universities um, is to start following them on social media, whether that's, you know, Facebook, if you're um, perhaps parents or something like that, um, right the way through to Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok accounts. Uh, don't worry, US universities have all of those. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about what that university is like, um, 
social media especially can be a really helpful tool to be able to understand what that university, what do we like to study at that university? Um, we get a lot of questions about whether you should visit a university before you apply there. Um, and especially so this year when, uh, you know, travel to the United States for most of us is just not possible. Um, I'll share with you that I had never ever been to America before I went. Um, I had not visited my university um, and I got on a plane on my own and flew off to California. Um, so it is totally possible and there are many British students who do not get to visit the university that they're going to go to before they actually go. Um, however, if you have that opportunity, um, that's an amazing option and you'll find that many universities um, have like a welcome centre and have daily campus tours uh, and information sessions as well. But you can learn an awful lot sitting at home. YouTube is an amazing resource for getting under the skin of the university as well. So just really encourage you to um, look at the different virtual options available. And many, many universities are holding virtual information sessions at the moment. So it's a really great way to engage with the university. Okay, so just to give you a couple of examples, um, this is Middlebury College. Uh, my colleague Holly has included it. She studied here, Middlebury College is in Vermont. Um, and as an example of the type of university you can find, it's a small liberal arts college. Um, so again, students get lots of um, uh, attention from the professors, it's small classes. Um, it has a real focus on things like environmental studies, um, but also languages are a huge at Middlebury College. Um, so again, it's another university that you might not have heard of, but is really difficult to get into and really amazing to study at. Another example could be Scripps College. So Scripps College is in uh, Pomona, California. Um, you'll find it's uh, part of a small network of the Claremont Co Colleges in California, um, sharing a campus with five other universities. Uh, Scripps College is a women's only college, um, but it, like I say, it's part of this university network. Um, and it's just an incredibly stunning place with amazing um, education uh, for women. Another example you could be looking at is somewhere like Vanderbilt University. So Vanderbilt is in Tennessee. Um, it's part of Nashville, so Music City, a huge, great big city and a, a much bigger university than Scripps or uh, Middlebury. Um, Vanderbilt has huge teaching hospitals and all sorts of different um, uh, disciplines. Um, it's also, as I say, in Music City, so you get a huge amount of cultural activity happening as well, but it might be a university you haven't come across before. So Vanderbilt, also an amazing university to check out. Just want to cover off Ivy League. I get a lot of questions about this. Um, so just to cover off uh, a few points about the Ivy League. So the Ivy League is definitely not the equivalent of the Russell Group. Uh, it makes me groan every time I see a journalist write that. Um, the Ivy League is simply a sports league. Uh, so eight universities in the New England area get together and they play football. And so they're all within two hours driving of each other. Um, and, you know, um, they're, they're just our sports league. Uh, there's no joining the Ivy League. There's no leaving the Ivy League. Um, and there's lots of universities that people think would be in the Ivy League, which are not. So, for example, MIT and Stanford are not in the Ivy League and never will be in the Ivy League. Um, so just a real encouragement to go beyond what you might be hearing in pop culture or in newspapers. Um, the other thing to just say about the Ivy League is they would be, they're all just private universities, they're all research institutions, so you might be missing um, options uh, that might be a really good fit for you. Um, just to flag that if we said top 1% of UK universities, given there's 120 universities in the UK, uh, we'd be talking about 1.2 institutions, um, whereas top 1% in the US, you're talking about more than 40 universities. Most people in the UK couldn't tell you which of the 40 universities those would be. And then finally, I just want to flag that the Ivy League institutions, um, along with many other well-known institutions, are extremely competitive to get admitted to. Um, and so you'll find that admission rates of under two or 3% is is very much the norm with this group of universities. 
Um, so just an encouragement to think broadly and open-mindedly. Um, it's not bad to apply to them, but make sure that you're um, keeping, keeping your options open along the way. Okay, so I'm gonna change up a little bit. So that's thinking about um, choosing universities and how do you go about the process of researching universities. Now we're going to go into this area around funding your studies. So funding is an area we get so many questions about, um, but it's also an area that US students often have to grapple with as well. So just know that you're not on your own um, when you're going through this process. But it is a bit different to how funding works here in the UK. Um, and so you'll just want to kind of um, be aware of, of how, how this game works um, and why it's different to UK universities. Okay, so what kind of costs might you expect when you are looking at US universities? So there's some costs that are gonna come with the application. So you'll need to prepare, you need to sit um, for admissions exams. You may find that there's some costs there. You may need to pay um, some application fees when you submit your applications to US universities. So you will want to pre um, prepare for some costs there. Um, and then you'll also want to think about the costs of getting a visa to study in the US. So if you're not a US citizen, um, you will need to be able to get a student visa and that comes with its own costs. And then you're also going to want to think about um, the costs of tuition and fees to study at a particular university. Um, and just be aware that that can be hugely different depending on what university you're looking at. And then you'll also want to think about the cost of living um, and any other expenses. So just to clarify, at a US university, um, they don't really talk about tuition fees like we do. We say, okay, what's the tuition fee? Um, and, and by that, we mean that, that cost that we pay to a university. In the US, um, they think about what's the cost to be a student at that university. So they will include the tuition, but they'll also cost, include that cost of living. So, um, that could be a, a room in the dorms, it could be a meal plan, it could be um, books and other expenses, it could be personal expenses. Some universities will even think about things like transportation. What a US university will do is, is calculate those costs for an average student on their campus, roll those numbers all together and they express it as cost of attendance. So what you'll find on their website is the cost of attendance and that's per year at that university. So if you're doing a four year degree, that's four years of that cost of attendance. So just make sure that if you're comparing that to UK universities, that you've thought about what costs you might incur for studying at a UK university. So, um, you know, alongside tuition fees, you're probably going to maybe need a room in halls, you're going to need some train tickets home, you're going to need some food, hopefully you're going to study, uh, maybe you need a laptop, things like that. So you're just going to want to uh, make sure you're combining, uh, comparing like to like. Um, I also just want to flag um, health insurance. You get lots of questions about health insurance. Um, generally, you'll find that US universities are not keen on having um, uninsured students on campus um, because Americans pay for their, um, for their health care. Um, they buy health insurance to cover costs um, if they're ill. Um, there's no NHS in the US. So what universities do is normally require an international student to have health insurance um, to be able to study on campus, because if you're ill, they want you to be able to access healthcare. Um, most universities will offer a healthcare policy uh, for students. It's normally um, a, an inexpensive healthcare, health insurance uh, policy to help help students. Okay. So, Having said all of that, there is some really good news here. And this is something that often uh, many people in the UK aren't aware of. There is some really good news in that there is funding available. If you're willing to be open-minded, if you're willing to do the research, if you're willing to go and find really good fit universities for you, then you may well be able to access pots of funding to help go and study in the US. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how those work what's available um, and how that, how that goes down. Okay, so in terms of thinking about how we fund a US university, so 
the first expectation a US university will have is that the student and their family will be thinking about how they're going to contribute to the cost of education. So I'm sure some of you might have heard this idea of college funds. Um, if you've ever watched anything um, to do with Americans, you often hear about this idea of college funds. There is a, a culture in the US of saving parents, saving towards the cost of college young people getting jobs and saving towards the cost of college um, and that a family does everything that they can to help their young person go and get educated and that education is um, a really great way to use money so that's just so you everyone's aware of that uh, that's the kind of expectation from a university's perspective so you want to think about what um, family funds might be available is that it's there any saving towards the cost of university that can be put towards this cost at a US university the thing I wanted to just share with you is that many British students find the best source of funding beyond their family and personal funds uh, is actually US universities themselves Many US universities um, will have funding available to support international students. And we're going to talk about how that works in a minute. We'll also find that maybe some, we call them external funding bodies here, but you might find that there are external organizations that are not the university, they're everybody else who might have scholarships or other funding available for students. And we'll talk about those too in a moment. And then I just want to flag loans. So unfortunately, you can't take your UK student loan with you to go and study in the US. Um, it's just not possible. Um, and unless you're an American citizen, you won't qualify for US student loans. Uh, they're open, only open to American citizens. So you want to be really aware that if you need to look at loans, I just also always caution you to be careful and because you're likely to be looking at commercial loans if that's what you need to help make this dream happen. And I just really encourage, this goes back to that piece about research and about being open-minded. I'd always really encourage you to think, are there alternatives rather than taking out commercial loans? Um, so, and there normally are options out there. So being open-minded and flexible with your choices will really help in this place. Okay, so this idea of university funding, how does this work? What's available? Uh, what does this do? So uh, university funding uh, can fall into several different types of funding. So first thing I'm gonna jump into here is merit-based scholarships. So merit-based scholarships are is money that universities offer to students because they are the best at something. It's the easiest way to think about it. Perhaps you are one of the best students applying from the UK. Perhaps you've got some of the best A-level results. Maybe you are a top test taker um, and you've done really well in American admissions exams or your grades from high school have been amazing. And the university really wants to encourage you to attend their university. Or maybe you're an amazing, I don't know, cello player and they're looking for a very talented cellist to join their university orchestra. That might have a merit-based scholarship attached to it. Or perhaps you're an incredible track athlete and you are amazing. You might qualify for a sports scholarship. Um, scholarships come in all sorts of different um, sizes. So some uh, might be things like $5,000 a year towards the cost of studying at university or $10,000. Uh, some of them can be full tuition um, and can cover huge amounts of the cost of studying at a US university. Uh, it's about finding a university where you're going to be a good fit, not only for the university, but also for that scholarship um, and which offers the scholarships that you need. Um, so please do have a look out. You'll find those on the university websites, often in the section called financial aid, and you'll see about scholarships. Um, and the process to go and apply for those, which is normally done alongside the application process to the university as a whole. And then I also just want to flag this other type of money available at universities. And this is called need-based aid. 
Uh, so need-based aid is money you would need in order to be able to study at the university. Not all universities offer it to international students. So you want to read really carefully as you're doing your research about US universities. But there are a significant number who offer this money. It's competitive to gain, um, but what you'll find, how it works is um, you will find that a university will have the cost of attendance. So that's how much it costs per year to attend at that university. Um, and then they, if they offer this need-based financial aid and they want to admit a student, they will look at the resources available to that family. So one family might be able to cover the whole cost of studying at that university, great they might not get any need-based financial aid. But another family might not have perhaps any income coming in or might have a limited amount of income coming in. Um, and so they just don't have as much, many resources available to pay for that university education. So if the university wants to admit that student, then they will look at what's available to, to that student and their family. And then they will work out um, the difference between that and the cost of attendance. And then they'll make that up uh, in gift aid. Not all universities offer this, um, but um, it is available. There is uh, There are universities that offer it um, and just really encourage you if that's um, something you're interested in. I'm very happy to take some questions at the end about how it works, um, but just know that that's an option option there and that universities, universities offer this type of money are keen to ensure that um, they are not that they are able to take um, the most talented students from around the world, regardless on their ability to pay for their education. So there is money out there, but it often requires people to be open-minded, to do your research um, and to um, be open-minded as you go. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example here. What does all of this look like? How would we see it on a website? So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Rice University. Rice University is one of my favorite universities. Um, it's in Texas, in Houston. It's a small private university. Um, it is, has some incredible science and engineering um, as well as the arts. Um, it's famous. Um, John F. Kennedy stood on campus at Rice and made his very famous speech at the beginning of the 1960s about how America was going to put a man on the moon. Uh, that happened at Rice University. Um, so it's a university with lots of um, amazing opportunities. And so just to give you an example, this is from their university website, just taking a screenshot. This is the Office of Financial Aid. Um, and here they are talking about um, the cost of attendance. Um, each university can set its own costs, as we talked about earlier, but you'll see here, this is fairly representative of what an elite private university might be charging. You can see their cost of attendance is 67,000 and some change dollars. Um, I don't know my currency conversions for today, but know that that is a, a, a lot of money by anyone's standard. And you can see how they've reached this. So they've got that tuition, fees, room and board, books and personal expenses. So that personal expenses being money for coffees or for no fun or for toiletries or for clothing or anything else that you might need while you're a student. So here is a breakdown of how they've got to this list um, and, and that cost of attendance. So how do you go about finding information? Well, also on the Office of Financial Aid is a page about merit scholarships. Um, so here it says merit-based scholarship recipients generally distinguish themselves scholastically and personally, even within a highly competitive group of admitted students. And then you can see they list some reasons that they have given away merit scholarships. So perhaps you're looking at this and you're like, I'm a great fit for rice. And guess what? I'm also, I know, an entrepreneur or I'm an exceptional writer. Maybe I'll qualify for a scholarship here. Um, and they explain how this process works. So all admitted freshman applicants are automatically considered for merit-based scholarships. So no separate application form or interviews are necessary. And the Office of Admission notifies scholarship winners at the time of admission to the university. So if you're admitted, you could also find that you have been offered a scholarship. So this is merit-based scholarships. Now they also have a helpful page for international students, which is amazing. And you can see here a statement that they, I put a red box around it just so we can be clear which bit we're talking about. 
At Rice University, we believe costs should not be a barrier to attending one of the finest universities in the country. We admit students from all socioeconomic backgrounds and fund many students who might not otherwise be able to afford a Rice education. And here's the magic bit. International students who receive need-based aid will have 100% of demonstrated need met with institutional grant aid. What does that mean? It means if you're an international student, which unless you're an American citizen, that would be us, um, and you need money to be able to attend, so this is need-based financial aid. And if you had literally, your family had literally no money, but you were rice material, they would make up 100% of the cost of studying. That's both tuition and room and board and all those other costs. 100% um, of demonstrated need with institutional grant aid. This means it's a grant, so it's not money that you would pay back. This is... Uh, gift money. Um, so you can see here that's that's the kind of language that you would be looking for for a university that offers need-based financial aid. It doesn't need-based financial aid doesn't just have to be for students with no money. Um, it's kind of a means testing scale. So you'll find that even families with what we would consider here middle or even middle high incomes will qualify for some need-based financial aid. Uh, often um, when you're when you're looking at these kind of universities and um, so please don't rule yourself out um, and know that that's an option and you can see here they've then explained how a student goes about getting this need-based financial aid at the time of applying you would uh, fill out a form called the CSS profile um, alongside your application and the university would be able, then be able to consider that okay so that's the university funding other places you can look for money um, include external funding bodies. So these could be foundations, they could be charities, they could be um, associations they, um, that might be able to offer um, some kind of funding towards studying in the US. Sometimes some British students, uh, I worked with a student in Scotland last year who's ha whose local council had a pot of funding to be able to help students study internationally. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was definitely helpful towards covering some of the cost of um, flights to the US and things like that. You might be able to find that there are, um, you know, charities or companies that are willing to sponsor you. You can find all sorts of scholarship engines if you have a look on our website um, about how those work. Um, lots of links on our website to different search engines. Um, and then you may find that there are some universities that have a, an external funding body attached. Um, so a good example would be somewhere like the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill which is a top public university. Um, the Moorhead Kane Foundation is affiliated with UNC Chapel Hill. The Moorhead Kane Foundation offers to British students a fully funded scholarship that covers the cost of tuition, living, flights, um, all the costs of studying at the university, plus also funds summer experiences uh, in between each of the four years of study. Um, and this amazing alumni community that you would join. Uh, though, you know, that's a kind of very, very ultra generous uh, scholarship awarded by an external funding body. And that's the Moorhead Kane Foundation Scholarship uh, for UNC Chapel Hill. So having a look around for those, you might be able to find all sorts of different options. So please do um, explore those along the way. Okay, so funding strategy, some things to think about. You might want to think about the cost of living when you're assessing studying at a US university. So just like if you thought about in the UK, um, it's probably cheaper uh, to live in, say, Lancaster and go to the University of Lancaster than it is to live in central London um, and go to, I don't know, LSC. So too you'll find in the US cost of living can um, very dramatically. So if you say I want to go to university in the middle of Manhattan, you're going to find that it's more expensive to live there than say, I don't know, Michigan, for example, and go to Michigan State University. Um, the cost of living can, can, can vary hugely and that can be a way of managing cost um, while still getting a great education. Another thing to think about is the tuition costs. So different universities will cost different amounts. You'll find that private universities tend to have higher tuition costs, um, whereas many public universities have lower 
tuition costs, so that could be a way to manage the cost of studying in the US. Um, and then finally, you just also want to bear in mind that different universities have different levels of funding available. So while um, counterintuitively, private universities might be a lot more expensive uh, in terms of their sticker price, what you might find is that actually they have more funding in the form of need-based financial aid or scholarships available than perhaps those state universities do. So um, really just encouragement to um, have a look around and balance out those different uh, pieces of the puzzle to help make funding happen. Okay, so I just want to cover off community colleges too. You might have heard of these. Um, community colleges, we don't have anything equivalent here in the UK. Uh, community colleges are amazing universities that uh, offer a two-year associate's degree. Um, so they allow students to do those first two years of study to get all those kind of general education credits in place. They're super supportive environments for an international student. Um, and offer top-notch um, educational experiences. And many, many of the community colleges have links to their local four-year universities. So what a student would do who goes down this route would do two years at a community college, and then they would transfer to the four-year university to do the final two years. And then they graduate with a bachelor's degree from that university, which they've managed to achieve in two years. Uh, plus the two years before at the community college. Why might someone do that as well? Well, community colleges are, hu are hugely less expensive than attending a four-year university, so you may well find that it is a cost-effective way uh, to have that same experience of living in the US, studying in the US, uh, and then to go on and have that two, two years at the four-year institution. Um, an example here is Los Angeles Valley College. It's a community college in Los Angeles. Um, and here are some of the relationships they have. So with UCLA, with USC, and with Cal Poly, all of these are top research universities in the state of California, and they all have relationships with Los Angeles Valley College. Um, so you can kind of transfer through and end up with a degree from UCLA or USC um, alongside um, this experience of studying at Los Angeles Valley College. Happy to take some questions about these at the end. Please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box and I will cycle back around to those at the end of this presentation. Okay, so the final few tips, funding tips, definitely start early, don't leave it till the end. You want to be thinking about it from, from the point where you start researching. You want to be flexible in choosing universities. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, be open-minded, be flexible um, when you think about your universities. I've got this little um, graphic here of FISH. Uh, you might choose to apply to one university where you're one of many, um, or you can choose to jump to a different bowl and stand out. Uh, so being open-minded, British students tend to apply to uh, the same few universities, so you can actually help yourself stand out by getting off the beaten path um, can be a really helpful um, approach here. And then just thinking about how you stand out at applicants at the university. Um, different universities, you will stand out in different ways. Are you the only British student applying that will make you stand out straight away? Or is it that you have particular things that make you a really good fit at that university and, and perhaps stand out even in a very a, a competitive pool? Again, happy to take some questions about all of this at the end. Okay, so we've been through funding and we've been through researching. So you've researched the university, you've checked out the funding and how that works. Um, and now we'll jump into how do you actually make that application? Uh, it is a little bit different to applying through UCAS. So here is a quick overview. Um, the first thing we want to think about is what are they looking for when they are looking, particularly for applying to a competitive university. You want to be thinking, what are they looking for? So the US university, they will be looking for your academics and they'll measure this with your GCSEs and your A-levels or your hires or your IB or whatever it is you're taking. They will want to know, um, are you a, a good student for their university? And they will look at, look at those academics. They'll also want to know about this idea of academic fit. So are you uh, a student who is um, you know, maybe the university has a lot of focus on intellectual curiosity, 
And maybe you're the kind of person who just always is asking why and is always doing extra research. You know, that may make you a really good academic fit at that university. Or maybe you are somebody who likes to think very deeply um, about things. So as you're looking for a university whose courses, uh, whose modules uh, offer a lot of kind of in-depth project work, maybe that's your fit. So thinking about your academic fit and what each university offers you um, will really help in this process. The university wants to know that you're going to be a good fit for what they're, they're offering. They'll also be interested to know about your extracurriculars, and this is quite different to how it is here in the UK. Um, remembering that universities are interested in knowing not just are you a great student, but they want to, to bring in a wide variety of different people into their university. Um, and so they will ask you about your extracurriculars. When your, your time is your own, what do you do with your time? Um, so you could, for example, you could have a part-time job, maybe, you could be in the drama club, you could be doing sports, you could be volunteering, you could be a young carer, you might have, um, you know, responsibility for looking after siblings, you might have commitments to your faith community, whatever it is, those are all extracurriculars and they're how you choose to spend your time. And a US university wants to know about that and it forms part of their admissions decision along the way. And then they also want to know about what's called your personal attributes. And this is really difficult to explain, but it's things like leadership. They want to know what kind of character are you? Are you somebody who has a lot of integrity? Are you somebody, are you the kind of person who always has something to say about everything? And you've always got your hand up in class? Or actually the kind of person who steps back and has a look at the whole picture before making your contribution? There's no right or wrong there, but uh, universities want to make sure that they've got a little bit of everything, um, but anything you can do to demonstrate leadership or commitment or um, anything like that, universities will also be on the lookout for, for that, for people to join their campus community. Okay, so what goes into an application? Well, here you go. Each university that you apply to, you will be submitting the following things. Uh, there'll be an application form. This it has all the stuff about who you are, so your name and contact details and details about your family and what you're studying at school. Uh, but it'll also have a list of your extracurriculars on it. Um, you'll also submit two to three essays. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, you will also submit potentially some admissions exam scores. Um, we'll cover those in a second as well. Uh, two to three recommendation letters. Uh, these will come from your teachers um, and we'll talk about those in a minute. A transcript which is also made by your teachers which is like a record of what you've studied at school um, and then finally potentially an admission an application fee uh, per university you're attending uh, you're applying to and universities can set that fee for themselves. There is no limit to the number of um, universities you can apply to um, but I would suggest um, at a maximum somewhere between six and ten would be a sensible amount to know that you've done really good applications um, for and you know really spent your time on those applications. So admissions tests, lots of questions here. Um, admissions tests, um, many people have heard of the SAT. Um, there are actually two exams in the US, the SAT or the ACT. Um, the SAT and the ACT are essentially uh, very similar to each other. Um, my analogy here would be it's like Coke versus Pepsi. At the end of the day they're both brown and fizzy, um, but some people have a preference for one or the other. You can sit um, both of those exams here in the UK. Um, there, are, there are sittings for those and you can go to the SAT website or the ACT website and book in for those. Universities have no preference between the two. You will mostly see that they will list them side by side and they will show average scores uh, for students admitted at the university for both tests. Often people tell me, oh my goodness Rowena, is it better to do the SAT or the ACT? And my response always is find the one that you do better on and do that one. Um, so you can download free practice papers, uh, there's all sorts of textbooks online, um, you can even join classes if you want to pay for classes. Um, so it really doesn't matter which one you do. 
um, but um, not all universities are looking for these exams. So this year with the coronavirus um, pandemic, um, most US universities have actually said that they do not require these exams because it's been a very difficult for students to sit these exams this year. Um, a jury is out on what will happen in 2021, 2022. But for this academic year, most universities do not need these. So if it's difficult to sit for these exams, then don't worry about it. You'll see universities are talking about that on their website. Um, but um, if you're looking to apply further on out, uh, do keep an eye on whether you need to take these exams or not. You do not need to take these exams. I strongly recommend don't worry about it. Um, just because they're really quite different to any kind of exam you might have studied here in the UK. Um, and I'm just all about not taking exams that we don't need to take. But if you do need to take these exams, you will find that both of them, uh, both of them are very similar. So they are assessing the multiple choice exams. They're about four hours long and they are assessing um, uh, basic skills such as numeracy, um, and uh, your um, quantitative and qualitative reasoning, uh, your knowledge of American grammar, your reading comprehension, um, you know, algebra, calculus, all of these things. And they're quite, they're taught, they're made for Americans. So it's definitely something that you, if you're going to take these exams that you need to do a bit of study for, you need to prepare for, even if you are feeling, you know, if you're just saying, oh, okay, I'm doing A-level maths, a level further maths, even students doing A level further maths, I would suggest doing a bit of work to make sure that you're familiar with what the questions are asking for and how they work. Um, most people will find that they're better at either the kind of maths uh, side or the reading and um, writing side of things. Um, don't, don't be put off if you have a strength on one rather than the other. Universities kind of expect that. Um, but just know that these are exams that are able to be taken here in the UK. Um, we get a lot of questions about them, but know also that not all universities by any means require these exams. So again, happy to take questions at the end. Um, and then finally, I just want to cover something called the SAT subject tests. Um, a few, and there's literally a handful of universities, uh, may ask for SAT subject tests. You can't take SAT subject tests in place of the SAT. If they're asking for the SAT, then that means uh, the main SAT exam. But for universities asking for SAT subject tests, um, and like I say, it's literally a handful of universities. Uh, these are specifically hour long exams on things like foreign languages or history or geography and things like that. So um, you can also take those here in the UK. They just require a bit of planning because you can't take the SAT or, or the SAT on the same day as the SAT subject tests. So a little bit of planning if you decide you do need to take those exams and to, to take the SAT subject tests. The SAT reasoning exam and the ACT, the SAT and ACT um, are available um, much more much more widely than the SAT subject tests. Okay, so other things that go into your application, transcript, lots of questions about this. This is a document made by your teacher. Um, essentially, we've got a, a template on our website that your teachers can download. Um, it's a list of your academic qualifications. So if you live in England, Wales or Northern Ireland, uh, it would be a list of your GCSEs with the grades that you received and then a list of your A-levels if you're doing A-levels uh, and your predicted grades. And your teacher will make that on your behalf and submit that to your university on your behalf. They'll also submit a document called the school report or school profile. That's like um, a document that explains, um, explains a bit of context about your school. So what kind of school is it? What kind of options were available to you? Uh, what kind of neighborhood is your school in? What's your... Uh, you know, what's the kind of attainment and achievement at that school uh, so that the university has a bit of context for what you've achieved. Okay, also recommendation letters, these are also made by your teachers. Um, so you, most people will submit um, three 
letters. Most students applying to the US will have three letters written for them. Um, these letters, one will be from someone like your head of year or your head of your form or um, perhaps a careers teacher or something like that. They'll act as what's called your counsellor um, and they will talk about you as a student in your school. So what do you do? What do you do to contribute to the school community? What kind of person are you? Um, and kind of give you a view of, of the, the you as a student at that school. And then there'll be two subject specific teacher letters. So these are uh, teachers who actually teach you will write about what it's like to teach you um, what you contribute in the classroom. So just know that these letters are really important in this process, but definitely not um, something that most teachers are used to writing unless your school sends lots of students to the US. I'd really encourage, we've got a whole page of advice and guidance on our website um, for teachers um, to help put these letters together. Um, our tips for you, remember these are a marketing tool, uh, part of the admissions process is going to be scrutinised, so think carefully about which teachers um, you might ask to write these letters. Um, we'd encourage you to write, uh, to meet with, uh, meet with these teachers um, and perhaps just talk about, um, you know, what you've enjoyed in their class or what you've uh, been up to, but you won't actually see these letters before they're submitted. The teachers will um, submit them on your behalf you won't see them um, before they submit them. So you want to be kind of thoughtful with the, with who you pick um, and perhaps what you brief them up. And just in my encouragement, we're very British, we're very modest. Uh, lots of teachers, um, uh, you know, just encourage teachers to be really enthusiastic in their letters. Um, so that too. Okay, quick note about essays. So, um, most people are familiar with the idea of UCAS personal statement. My number one tip in this area is do not copy and paste your UCAS personal statement into an American admissions essay. Um, American admissions essays are very different to what we write here for university admissions um, here in the UK. Um, American essays are about giving a perspective, a viewpoint, showing the admissions officer how you see the world, um, rather than just a list of the the you know work experience and the um, extracurriculars and things that you do, um, things you've read. So you want to be thinking how can you tell perhaps a story uh, that's true about how you see the world. So I'll give you some examples. Um, some great essays I've read recently. Um, a student who grew up not far from where I grew up um, wrote his essay about his part-time job at McDonald's. It was a story of one shift. He talked about putting on his uniform. He, he talked about putting on his hat. Um, that's how the essay started. And it was the story of the things that happened to him during this one shift at his part-time job at McDonald's. Um, and what you really got from that was how he saw the world, how he understood the people that he was interacting with, um, and a real sense of his empathy and his understanding of the people that he came across. So that student is now studying at Pomona College in California um, and was just a really amazing essay. Um, another essay I've read recently um, was all about um, a somebody who grew up on an island in the Outer Hebrides um, and she was talking about being the girl after uh, having lots of older brothers um, and having boots passed down her family and having to wear her big brother's boots that were too big for her and trying to keep up running down the beach on the island on which she lived. Um, and then halfway through she started quoting the little mermaid, I want to be where the people are, talking about you know how the Scottish island that she had grown up on um, had been an amazing experience but she was actually ready to live somewhere bigger um, and to be more in the middle of kind of city life um, and so that's what she was looking for and again you had a sense of um, her perspective on the world and what she could offer uh, to a university. So um, a really great resource I'm going to point to here is College Essay Guy. If you could just google College Essay Guy uh, there is a really great website run by an American man who um, has lots of help and advice uh, and lots of examples of the types of essays that you would be aiming at um, for this. 
Okay, so a few tips, um, answer the question fully, avoid cultural references and cliches. Um, there are lots of things that make sense to us as Brits, but actually don't make a whole lot of sense to an American. Uh, make sure you're proofreading and also most importantly, be yourself. Don't be what you think someone thinks you should be, be yourself um, it's the best way to be. So you'll find that um, US university applications will ask for one longer essay, which you can use for all the universities you're applying to. Um, and then you'll find that many universities may ask for what's called a supplement question, which will be specific to that university. So it might be as simple as why do you want to come to our university? Or, you know, why do you want to study at the University of Michigan? Or it could be, um, you know, something a bit more creative. So um, the University of Chicago, for example, is very famous for its quirky questions. Um, in the past, they've had questions like, um, um, where's fi find X? That was just the question that you asked for a response. So some students came up with like really complicated mathematical formulae, uh, whereas others drew pirate treasure maps. Um, you know, and the University of Chicago was interested in all of those things. They were interested to uh, see how students were thinking and responding. So supplement, quite, um, supplement essays will be specific to each university, whereas the longer essay, single essay, you can normally use across all the different universities you're applying to. Okay, we are nearly there um, and then we'll take some questions. So just a reminder, if you've got questions, question and answer box and we'll try and get through as many as those as possible. Um, what are the other options to study in the US? And there are other options out there. So just to cover off some of those, um, if you're interested in studying in the US, but you're not sure you want to do a full undergraduate degree, which is what we've been talking about mostly, um, then do have a look at undergraduate level programs here in the UK. Um, so you'll find many UK universities have what's called a university exchange program. So you can do a degree from a UK university paying UK tuition, getting your UK student loan, um, and then have the option to spend a, perhaps a semester or even a year um, in at an American university. Uh, so it's a really great opportunity. Do have a look. Lots of UK universities uh, offer this for all sorts of different subjects. Um, so please do check that out. And also have a look at summer institutes um, or summer, summer schools. Uh, lots of American universities offer these. You can normally find them. They'll be, um, you know, anywhere from a week or two to four weeks long um, and give you the option to go and live on campus to study uh, something at that university for a summer session. So that could be between high school and university or perhaps between one of the years of your university degree here in the UK. And then also just to flag American studies degrees. Um, if you're into the kind of arts and humanities, do have a look at American studies, uh, which often have an inbuilt university exchange uh, built into them um, at a wide range of American universities. So again, American studies here in the UK can be a really good, um, a really good option. Um, you can also have a look at internships and summer work. So um, internships, lots of companies offer internships, but you'll also find that there's summer, summer programs. So things like Camp America, uh, super popular with British students, um, but also things like, did you know Disney recruits um, uh, UK students to work in its theme parks each summer. So if you fancy a summer working at Disney in Florida, for example, you could go and do that. Um, those options are out there. And then finally, I also just want to flag, if you are interested in studying in the US, but maybe not right now, you could always have a look at postgraduate study. We have all sorts of resources about postgrad study uh, on our website and do all sorts of similar events to this, all about postgrad in the USA. So that might be another option to have a look at. How can we help you in this journey um, beyond tonight? So lots of different ways that we can help. Um, I just want to flag the Sutton Trust US program. Uh, alongside being an Education USA advisor, I'm also the program director for this program uh, that we uh, deliver in partnership with the Sutton Trust. Um, so it's a Fulbright and Sutton Trust program. It's for very high achieving year 12 students from low income families. Um, so if that is you, please do have a look at this. Applications have just opened for this program. 
Um, this program is about 18 months long and it helps students explore US universities to explore what it might mean to study at a US university. And then if students want to, we'll support them through the application process as well. Uh, these are some of the students that we've worked with on the program uh, who have got into top US universities and we help them win the financial aid, normally need-based financial aid that they would need to be able to attend. Um, it's an entirely free program if you are accepted onto the program um, and applications are currently open. So if you Google Sutton Trust US program, uh, you'll come up with the website. Uh, there is indeed a web webinar that we're running tomorrow evening um, all about the Sutton Trust US program. So if you're interested, you can also learn more there. Okay, so other, other ways we can help. Uh, this is um, our website please do have a look at the going to the USA section. We have full guides. Everything I've talked about today is on there. Lots of videos, lots of helpful resources, loads of links off to lots of different um, resources that you can use to support your journey to studying in the US. So please do make the most of this. It literally is um, packed with information and all freely available. We also take questions by phoning by email. You can find out more information about this on our website. Um, this is a great if you come across something on a university website and you're not quite sure what it means or you want to clarify something, we're very happy to help. So please do uh, make the most of that. Um, another great opportunity is USA College Day. So USA College Day is our flagship event. Uh, we hold it each September um, and we have in 2019, we had 180 universities fly in to meet British students. It is entirely free um, and held in London each year. Uh, this year, coronavirus kind of put a stop to that, but we held a virtual fair instead um, and we had more than three and a half thousand people come and join us to meet again 180 universities in a virtual environment so just a real encouragement please do um, check it out for 2021 um, it's a really great way to help support your application and then we do all sorts of events about studying in the US uh, both online and then when we're out of this whole pandemic piece, we will resume our in-person events as well. So we do events around the country, um, but we also hold all sorts of webinars, both about the general process, but also um, about specific pieces of the process. So if please do check our website for all the events coming up. Okay, so phew, lots of talking, um, but hopefully this has been helpful to understand what that process, why you might and think about studying in the US, how you go about researching universities, how you think about funding US undergraduate study, um, and then finally, how you go about that application process. And then we've also covered some of those other opportunities that might be available. So if you do have any questions, and I can see we've already got some, um, I'm gonna try and answer some of those as quickly as possible. Um, please do, um, uh, please do feel free to add to this list. I, I know we've come over a little bit in time, so if you need to head off, that's also totally fine. We'll be sending out a recording of the session um, after afterwards, um, plus copies of the slides. So if you do need to head off, that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much for joining us this evening um, and uh, you know, hugely appreciative of your time this evening. I'm going to try and answer as many questions as possible. I will keep going until I either run out of voice or you run out of questions. Um, so here we go. Um, so looking into these questions, um, great questions here. Okay, so really good question from, um, and I'm sorry if I'm about to mispronounce anyone's names, but um, Raman, um, for universities in America, do we have to take the SAT or can we get in with A-levels? Um, this is a really great question. Um, so you will be applying with A-levels um, if that's what you've been studying or if you've been doing hires or the IB or, or an American high school curriculum here in the UK, whatever it is, that was is what you'll apply with. And that's what all universities will want to know about. But on top of that, some universities may also additionally ask for an SAT exam or an ACT exam. Um, so it's just important to do your homework, 
to understand what the university needs. And if they are asking for the SAT or ACT, that will be in addition to your A-levels. So I hope that helps. Um, other questions? Um, okay, really great question here um, from Shan, Shan, Shan. I'm sorry if I'm completely getting your name wrong. Um, but as a you know, US citizen growing up in the UK, what funding is available for me and where can I get more information about this? This is such a great question. Um, so for many of us, um, we are just UK citizens or citizens of another country in the world that is not the USA and therefore we are counted as international students. Um, and therefore there's limited funding available to us. The great news is if you hold an American passport or, or, or are an American resident, then there is um, additional funding options available to you. So you'll find um, uh, US universities will have um, funding for what they call domestic students, so that's people with American passports, um, and that you'll often find there are additional scholarships available from US universities, or there is additional need-based financial aid that is not open to international students, but is open to you as an American citizen. Um, so it's basically really good news. Um, and so what I would do is um, have a look at some of those US university websites, but you can also have a look at that domestic student funding um, as a US citizen. Um, so looking at the US university websites is the best place to start. Um, you can also, um, you may qualify for something called the FAFSA, which is the American Student um, Federal Funding. Um, so if you search FAFSA on, on, in Google, uh, you will find the page, web pages about that and how you go about applying for FAFSA um, alongside applying to the universities or financial aid. So that's another really good option. So if you're an American citizen, you've got additional options um, available to you. Okay, great question from Arista. Uh, when is the best time to start researching? Um, it's a great question. Almost, there's, it's never too early to start, um, but obviously you would build up perhaps the intensity. So if you're in year 10, year 11, something like that, um, you can start, start, you've got lots of time and you're in a really great place. If you're in year 12 right now in England, Wales, in England or Wales, year 12, so that penultimate year of high school, um, then, you know, it's a, an absolutely brilliant time to be researching. You can think about what you're looking for and you can think about um, what you're looking for in a university and then start to do that research. Um, I, if you're already into year 13 and looking to apply this year, then I would really encourage you to, you're going to need to do that research really rapidly. Um, and I just encourage you to be really thoughtful um, and devote some time to doing that research um, in order to put yourself in the best possible position to have the strongest possible applications. Okay, um, other questions? Yeah, so really great question about, uh, some universities have online financial aid calculators, but they're based on US tax forms. Is there any info on your website about how to fill out these forms? So in terms of uh, some universities do indeed have little helpful widgets um, uh, with calculators. Um, they tend, in my experience, to be wholly, normally very unhelpful for British students um, applying to US universities. But as you know, they are based on US uh, income and, and other things like that. Um, so I would have a look at the university's website is a starting point. And if you've got questions, you're very, um, universities really don't mind you writing and getting in touch with them. So if you write, there's normally a contact for the admissions office and you can actually write to the admissions officer um, and ask perhaps um, some of the, the more detailed form uh, questions about how financial aid might work. Um, if you can't find that information on their website. Um, US University Admissions Officers really don't mind hearing from prospective students. Um, just you want to be mindful that you're not asking questions that you can easily find uh, on the website. Okay. Um, okay, so um, 
what score would you need to get on the SAT smiley face? Thank you so much for the smiley face. I love it. Um, so what score would you need to get on the SAT or ACT? Um, honestly, um, it will entirely depend on you. Um, plus also what you what universities you're looking at. So there's no no university will say you must have this. It's not like UK universities where they will specify that you must have these grades at this level, at A level. Um, instead, US universities um, will be looking holistically at your application. So it's, it's not normally that they're just looking at one thing. They're normally looking at a combination of things. So they will look at the SAT or ACT if they require that. They will definitely look at your A-levels or your hires or your IB or whatever it is that you're studying. They will look at your extracurriculars um, and then they will look at your personal attributes and they will take those in a holistic way to make a decision about admission. Um, and so what you'll see on US university websites is if you um, type, if you go to a website, let's say you went to Rice website, Rice's website, and type into the search box class profile, you will be able to find a, a summary that that university has put together of last year's class, so the class they admitted this last summer, um, and some statistics about that class. And then many universities will have like an average SAT or AC, ACT score um, of students admitted to that university, or they'll have what they call the middle 50%, which is the 50% um, of students in the middle, what was their score range? And they'll do that for SAT and ACT. Um, and you can just start to use that to get a sense of how competitive your SAT or ACT score is um, in comparison to other students admitted to that university. Remember, it's an average, so there will be students above the average and there will be students below the average as well. Um, but it gives you a kind of guideline as a kind of ballpark that you might want to think about being in. There is no like magic score or anything like that you need to achieve. Obviously, the more competitive the university, presumably the higher the score will need to be. But it will always be taken in conjunction with everything else on your application. Okay, um, Stephanie, great question. Does it cost money to apply for the SAT or ACT? Um, if so, how much? Amazing question. Yes, it does cost to sit the SAT or ACT. Um, it's approximately, um, depending on the different options that you choose to sit, it's approximately 120 to 150 US dollars, which works out approximately $150 is roughly £120 or so. So they are quite expensive spendy exams that you're going to need to think about how you're going to uh, budget for some of those costs. Um, and so yes, they cost to it sit and you sit them, there's certain weekends each year that they're offered here in the UK. So um, you'll want to plan ahead a bit, make sure that you're saving up for those exams, but also that you're planning when you're going to take them um, as well. Okay, thank you, Felix. I'm glad it was helpful. Amazing. Um, Okay, Ke Kea, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your, your name. With neither American or British passport, is it harder to get in? Um, I'm going to define that as American passport and then everybody else's passport. So whether that's a British passport, an Irish passport, a um, Chinese passport, um, a Saudi Arabian passport, whatever passport you have, if it isn't an American passport, then you are counted as international. Um, and it's just bearing in mind, US universities would like to have international students on campus. They really value the perspectives that international students bring and the energy that international students bring. And they recognize that we, as international students, contribute to um, the kind of learning environment. Um, so, US universities are looking for international students. Um, often the funding available for international students is lower um, than it is for American students. And that's just because it's America and that's, you know, um, 
first and foremost American students there. So in terms of is it harder to get in, um, I wouldn't necessarily agree that it's necessarily harder to get in if a university is looking for the top students and they're interested in students from around the world. Um, but um, in terms of funding, it definitely is easier if you have an American passport, but not, not impossible in any way, shape or form. Okay. Um, great. Um, Ella Boddington. By the way, my surname is Boddington too, so that is amazing. Um, so Ella, as a student wanting to go to a US university on a sports scholarship, should I still apply on my own and go through the university or should I contact coaches? This is such a great question. So if you are um, an athlete looking for a sports scholarship and generally for purposes of this conversation, let's assume that um, the kind of competitive level you'd be looking at is county level in your sport or above. Um, if that's you, then I would be encouraging you to write out to coaches. So identifying universities that are a really good fit for you as a student for the things you want to study, but also which are a good fit for you and your sport. And I would start to contact um, those coaches. There's on our website a whole checklist for student athletes and I really encourage you to go and have a look at that. We've literally put together a step-by-step -step guide um, of the steps that you should take um, to help get 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 um, seen by coaches um, and you want to find coaches that are interested in talking further with you but you'll still need to go ahead and apply to the university um, but often if you're being a recruited athlete um, then the coach will be keen to signpost you towards making that application. If however you just love your sport um, and you want to go to a US university, maybe you even want to play the sport at the university um, on a competitive level, you can apply directly to the university. You just might not be considered for a sports scholarship um, in itself. Does that make sense? I hope. Um, but please feel free to get in touch. Um, if you want to talk further about sports scholarships. Okay. Um, other questions, right. Okay. Lots and lots of questions. Guys, I'm gonna try and, um, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm getting some of the big, big questions out of the way so that, um, uh, and I'll just keep then trying to answer some. So Isabel, really good question. You guaranteed to transfer if you go to the community college first. Um, it depends on the community college. It's definitely something to be asking the community college about. Um, so if you're having a look at the community college, um, you will be able to find uh, information on their website about the transfer routes available. And it is absolutely something I would recommend you ask the, the community college about um, and what what support they give to students and what likelihood is it um, to go to. So it will differ community college to community college. So just really recommend talking to that university. Okay, um, William, great question. Does the availability of scholarships change throughout the year? When should I look for them and apply? Always start early, the early bird catches the worm. Um, so, you know, in that research phase, keep track of um, the scholarships available. Um, some universities will have deadlines by which you need to apply to be considered for scholarships. Um, so I definitely encourage you to um, keep a note of those and make sure that you're applying for those. So for example, um, the scholarship, the UNC Chapel Hill Scholarship, the Moorhead Kane Scholarship, um, they've already closed applications for this year which will be funding students starting in September, uh, August 2021. So that process has been and gone but if you are looking to start in August 2022 then you can apply next September October time. Uh, so different universities will have different dates um, and so I just really encourage you to be on top of it and um, applying as soon as possible. Um, and just really make sure that you're following those dates. But normally the earlier you apply, um, the better um, along the way. And sometimes we get phone calls in kind of March time when people start getting their um, admissions decisions and they say, well, I've just realized I've been admitted to my dream university, but how do I get a scholarship? 
And it kind of at that point, it's just far too late. So you want to be thinking about it. If you're applying this year, you want to be thinking about it right now. Okay, so some more questions, let's see. Um, so scholarships, uh, so are there any scholarships for US citizens living in the UK? Um, it will, pro my advice would be to start with, um, it's a really good question, to start with having a look at uh, the US universities. That's normally the most fruitful place, Caroline, for um, finding scholarships. Um, and then starting to look around, sometimes you find different um, associations of Americans in the UK or sometimes American companies in the UK that um, have a large American workforce may have scholarships available. So it is really a case of having a look um, around um, and then also being aware that there are lots of scholarships that um, if you're a US citizen, you are eligible for that. Those of us without a US passport are just not, um, not eligible for. So definitely having a look for those. Um, Joshua, any specific advice for an aspiring computer science student? Um, amazing. Um, make sure you do your research, have a really good look. Computer science is really common uh, major at a US university, so um, really starting to have a think about what do you want from your university experience? Uh, what kind of university is going to be a good fit for you? Uh, what options is it? that you're particularly interested in the internship opportunities. Um, maybe it's a particular computer lab that you're interested in. Whatever it is that you're looking for, um, have a look around for that and find universities that are going to be a good, good fit uh, for what you're interested in. Um, Bianca, Ban Banker, uh, do you have to be the best student to get a scholarship or can you be very good and be an athlete? Um, so it depends on what scholarships you're looking at and at what universities. So um, if you are applying to uh, a university with, let's say, 40,000 um, people who are also applying for just one of the 1,400 seats um, at that university. So let's let's say Harvard, for example. Um, last year, I think it was about 45,000 people applied. Um, and there was 1,400, 600 seats uh, in their incoming class. Um, and you can bet your bottom dollar that most people applying to Harvard that year had top grades, top test scores, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the university, it was just a very, it's just a very tough um, uh, competition to be in. Um, but if you apply somewhere else, then you might actually be the top student applying at that university. So um, just being kind of mindful that you can start to change, change the game. And it, it's about being thoughtful with your university choices, finding a university that's going to be a good fit, um, both academically um, and also kind of socially, what you want out of your university experience. And there are loads of great universities um, all across the US. So different scholarships measure different things. Sometimes scholarships can be around athletic ability. Sometimes they can be um, around your scholarships or your grades and things like that. Sometimes they can be around um, other, other characteristics. So um, perhaps you are a female student interested in STEM. There might be a scholarship um, for female students interested in science, technology and engineering at that particular university. So it depends what you're looking for and um, what you're interested in and who you are, um, but definitely have a look around for those scholarships. Okay, any specific websites you recommend to look for US internships or apprenticeships? Another great question. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, you, for internships and apprenticeships, definitely have a look on our website. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if I can think of anything. So things like um, Camp America and things, you can also have a look at um, a website called BUNAC. Um, again, there's a link on our website to BUNAC who, who offer internships um, in the US and, and, you, and support you through that journey to picking up those internships. So that's a, a good resource to start, start having a look at that for, for yourself. So, UNAC uh, website is a good place for that. Okay, William, um, how common is it for an international student to get a full ride scholarship? 
if universities are need aware, will they be cut off by the funding required for me? This is a really great question, um, William. Um, so how common is it for an international student to get a full ride scholarship? So rather than talking about maybe a full ride scholarship, I would just suggest we call that to get a, a let's call it full financial aid. Um, it depends. So if you're looking at need based financial aid, it will depend on your family's circumstances and what money you would need in order to be able to attend. It's not what money you would like to pay, it's what money you would need uh, to be able to uh, go to that university. And so that's thing number one. Uh, thing number two is merit based scholarships um, uh, aren't dependent on how much resources your family has. Um, so you could have loads of money and still win a, a merit-based scholarship because they're based on merit whereas need-based financial aid is money based on on what resources you would need to be able to attend thirdly how common is it um it's they are competitive and not every university offers them um, and not every student would win a full fully funded place at a u.s university uh, it's much more common to see um, scholarships of 5,000, 10,000, perhaps half tuition, maybe full tuition, um, those tend to be uh, more, much more common. Um, but there are, are funding places um, available, including things like um, the Moorhead Kane Scholarship is a really good example. Um, Moorhead Kane Scholarship at UNC Chapel Hill, which is a merit-based scholarship, which literally covers the whole cost of an education at UNC, um, plus some um, with all the summer experiences and everything added in. And then you've got you've asked a question about if many universities are need aware, will they be put off by the funding? And um, that's a great question. So need aware is a an admissions term that a university uses when they look at uh, an international student's um, application. Um, if they're need aware, they'll have a look at your application, they'll decide maybe you're a great student, brilliant fit for their university, they absolutely would like you, but part of their admissions decision will be also having a look at what um, your financial need is, if they're offering need-based aid, and so they will look at what money you would need and can they afford that, so they will have a finite budget um, and they'll have to perhaps make some tough decisions um, about how many international students that they can afford to take on if they're covering huge parts of your um, cost to attend that university. So my advice here is always don't let need aware put you off. If you think you are a great fit for that university and that you can offer lots to that university and is a great fit for what you want to do, don't be put off by being need aware. If they say that they will meet um, demonstrated need, um, so, for example, you saw on rice, on the example I had on rice, uh, they said we will meet 100% of the demonstrated um, need of international students. And um, so if your need was 100% and they want to admit you, then they would um, cover that. Um, so I wouldn't be put off by need aware, just know um, it doesn't affect the amount of money necessarily that you get. It just means that the university is aiming to um, as to think about the budget they have available uh, to support international students who need new financial aid. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, great. Let me just see what other questions we've got coming in. Um, William, do you have to do another driving test in order to drive? Um, don't quote me on this. That's a great question that I haven't been asked in a while. I think you can use, if you've learnt in the UK, I think you can use your UK driver's licence to drive in the US, um, but that's absolutely a question that you can either ask the university um, themselves, um, or you could um, have a look on the US Embassy website, and there's probably the answer to that question there. But I think you can use um, a UK driver's licence, um, at least in the short term, um, uh, you know, initially in the US, um, but double check that. Um, okay, so 
My maths teacher is American. She told me she took the SAT three times and used her highest score. Do you recommend we start now by revising and take the SAT now? I'm in year 12, as we can take it, retake it later on if we need to. Amazing question. If you're in year 12 and you um, are looking at the SAT or ACT, then absolutely you can take the test um, now um, and see what score it is you get. If you get the score that you're super happy with, amazing. Um, you can check that one off your list and go, great, I am done. If, however, you get a score that you're like not so happy with, then yes, you can retake the SAT or the ACT again. Um, and so that's not a problem. Just know that they're expensive exams to take. Um, and personally, I hate taking exams. Um, so if you can, doing some preparation and then just taking the exam and being done um, is an amazing option. So, um, but yes, you can retake if you need to. Um, Neville, sorry for taking so long to come to your question. Um, do you advise using an agency or apply for yourself if you're looking to join a university with a specific sports scholarship? Um, I think this is a really personal decision. Um, there are companies out there that offer support to athletes um, to apply for sports scholarships. Um, and so if you choose to use an agency, then uh, you can absolutely do that. I would just be very aware that um, they can't promise you anything um, and that it is the university offering the scholarship. So you want to just be very careful. Um, I have heard that some families have paid huge amounts of money and then perhaps been dissatisfied with what they've actually ended up with or felt that they've been um, led astray. So there are some good agencies and some not so good agencies out there, but also know that we've got resources on our website, um, including a whole checklist uh, where you can do it for yourself if you would prefer to. Um, and it is absolutely possible to do it for yourself as well. So um, there's a whole checklist on our website on the sports scholarships page um, that you can follow if you would like to do that for yourself. Okay. Um, questions, questions. So, um, main differences, as well as asking, what's the main differences between the British and American universities from the social side? I'm assuming you mean like social life. Um, so it's going to differ university to university. Each American university will have um, different things they offer. Um, as a perspective, as a British person who studied in the US, um, my experience was that um, American students spend a lot of time creating a lot of fun things to do. There's a lot of clubs, a lot of societies, a lot of options to go exploring, um, to go um, and experience the great outdoors. That was something that my university was uh, keen to support students in doing. Uh, lots of universities will have lots of options around music, um, and so on. Um, there's a really strong dorm life um, experience at many US universities and they'll often have common rooms, um, kind of hangout spaces, so you'll find that that is uh, very common at a US university. Uh, you'll also find uh, most, many, many universities will have, you'll find if you're living in dorms, you will have a roommate. Um, I actually have two roommates um, at my university, um, so you find that you um, get to know your roommates really well and you often are kind of socialising with them. Um, I think one of the big differences um, between UK and US universities, uh, especially at the undergraduate level, is um, obviously the drinking age uh, for drinking alcohol in the US is 21. Um, and so therefore um, students at US universities are not drinking. Um, and uh, so night nightlife revolves rest for me at least I found that nightlife revolved less around kind of going out and bars and clubs and things and much more um, around different activities um, and per personally I enjoyed that more than being at a UK university um, but each each person has their own preference on that so hopefully that gives a sense that's just a personal reflection 
obviously having a look at each university um, it's also a really great question if you wanted to contact a, um, a university and ask to be put in touch with an international student studying at that university you can absolutely do that as well okay i am getting here um so community colleges after finishing the two years do you have to reapply and pay again for the next two years at a different university yes so the community college would help you with what's called the transfer process from the community college to the four-year university to do those final two years um, and so um uh you would be kind of applying but it would be applying as a transfer student so the process is a bit different um and uh in terms of paying so you'd be paying at the community college per year so you'd do one year two year and then you would pay at the four-year institution for those two years that you were studying there um, and most universities whether you go to a four-year institution all the way through or um, two years at community college two years at a four-year institution um they normally charge on a, an annual basis so you're paying each year um if that helps okay um William, when you take do the SAT, is your score saved on a database for universities to look at and potentially get in contact with you if they're impressed? Um, yes, if you check the box saying please please let universities uh, contact me, um, then yes, they can indeed get in touch if they would like to contact you. So yes, that is a thing. Um, great question. Do we have to use the Common App? Um, amazing question. So the Common App is um, a system, it's, I was going to say it's a little bit like UCAS, but it's not really, um, but it's a form that you fill in and it means that you don't have to fill in the form, you know, six or ten times or however many universities you're applying to. Common App is used by about 900 universities in the US. Uh, so not all universities use it at all. So MIT has its own application form. Uh, the University of Texas has its own application form. Um, but then a whole group of universities use something called the Common App. Um, it's, I think the Common App is the most user friendly of the uh, US application systems, um, but it will depend on what um, the university you're applying to is asking for. So if you are applying to a university that uses the Common App, then you will use that. If you're applying to a university that does not use the Common App, then you'll follow whatever instructions they give. And then the other thing is we've got a full guide, step by step, every single question, uh, guide to the Common App on our website as well. So you can get a PDF, which literally walks you through as a British student, how to fill out the Common App. Um, so please do enjoy that. Okay, and then if you did not have the absolute best GCSE grades, but you are not low income, is there any help for that? Is it harder to get accepted? Um, I think it's a really great question. Um, I think it will depend where you're applying. So uh, which different universities will, will require, will not require, different universities will regard your GCSE grades in different ways. So if you're applying, um, let's say that you had um, let's say fives across the board at GCSE if you're a student from England um, and uh, other students from England applying to that university all have nines um, then um, you will find that maybe you're at disadvantage then you might be applying to another university where actually you're one of the few British students applying and actually you're on par with other students applying to that university in which case um, it will um uh change how you're seen in comparison um and it may be that those universities have generous funding available so it's again it's all about doing that research finding a university that's really good fit um and also checking out the funding available um and i'm always shocked it's literally very few uh universities actually that many british students apply to um so there is just um uh a lot of um just get off the beaten path and the number of British students who decide to apply to say Harvard or Columbia is kind of intense um, but the more you can go and see the 4,498 other universities that exist um, 
the better because you will find lots of other options out there. Okay, we are so nearly there. Um, right, uh, finally, okay, great question. I'm on Caltech's website right now. I don't know um, where they actually say they need the SAT only or if they allow A-level. Um, so again, you'll be uh, looking here, you'll definitely be submitting for Caltech, you will definitely be submitting your A-levels and your GCSEs, so they will require that. Um, but they will specify if they need the SAT or ACT. Um, so uh, you will, if you go to the admissions section um, on their website and you may find there's a page for international students um, or there may be a page called something like application how to apply or application requirements um, and you'll be able to find there about standardized tests is what they'll call it the SAT or ACT um, and so you will see if you need to have that in addition to your A-levels but you absolutely will need your A-levels and GCSEs um, if you're applying to a school like Caltech. Okay um, as I can see there are 11 people hanging on here. I hope this is helpful and useful. I'll keep going until we've gotten through all the questions, but like um, um, I might lose my voice at some point. Um, okay. Great question. Yes. How can you find which universities have few international UK alumni? If I want to be flexible, maximise my choices, chances, studying in America and then I'd like to know about these universities. So William that's a really great question. Um, I would um, start by um, using something like Big Future College Search um, and then as you're looking at universities and let's say you're looking at um, somewhere like Denison for example um, which is a top liberal arts college um, in Ohio that offers uh, generous financial aid, it's test optional so you don't need to take the SAT or ACT, uh, it's on the edge of a city called Columbus so there's loads of like amazing opportunities for internships and things like that and it's beautiful. Um, then you could go on to Denison's website if you search in their search bar for something called the class profile um, then um, you will be able to find the stats about last year's admitted class and they'll normally talk about the percentage of international students um, and they may even break that down to students from Europe or even students from the UK so you can start to uh, find out a bit of information there and then if you um, want to go kind of go and be a bit extra um, then if you email the admissions officer and for Denison it's a guy called Bryce uh if you email the admissions office um uh you can um simply ask that question you know I, i'm looking at the university and i'm interested um i'd be interested to know um how uh, how um you know how many uh, students from the uk have studied at denison or are currently studying or how many international students and you can even um asked to be put in touch with an international student studying at the university you want to hit, be put in touch directly and they can tell you what it's like to study there so it's an option is there some sort of affirmative action towards UK students will they favour us at all um, I think universities are looking to get a really varied um, class of students so um, Let's say a university has about 13% international students, which is kind of a, a common kind of percentage, 15%, something like that. Um, the university, all 13% will not be from the UK. I can absolutely promise you that. Um, so universities are looking to build really varied um, uh, classes uh, with students from lots of different backgrounds. Um, and so um, there isn't necessarily like affirmative action um, for UK students, I just encourage students to to be as open-minded and think as broadly as possible about US universities. Um, US universities are amazing um, and there is a really great fit university for everybody out there so it's just about um, identifying what you're looking for and starting to identify that and then find universities that meet that criteria. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to take these last two questions and then I think I might need to stop because I'm losing my voice at this point. Um, 
but uh, William and Isabel um, asking, which university did you attend? Smiley face, thank you. And Isabel asked, how did you fund your university? Um, so I went to my US university was a university called UC Santa Cruz, University of California at Santa Cruz, um, which Santa Cruz is just south of San Francisco. Um, kind of um, at the bottom of the area called Silicon Valley, um, where a lot of the tech companies are. Um, it was amazing. Uh, I love Santa Cruz. Um, it was a university on the side of a mountain, um, big research university, side of a mountain overlooking the ocean. Santa Cruz is the home of surfing in the USA, very outdoorsy place, um, and totally was probably the best thing I've ever done with my life. Um, did not know what I was going into, never been to America um, before I went, so it was totally amazing to go. How did I fund it? Um, I was really lucky. I was able to pick up a university exchange from here in the UK um, and to be able to go out to the US, so that's how I did it. Um, but different students do that differently, and I've worked with literally hundreds of students who have managed to uh, find both admission and funding to top US universities all over America um, and I'm delighted because I get to go and see them do go and have the kind of experience that I wish everybody could have um, in studying at a US university. Okay with that I am going to finish here and um, thank you so much if you are some of the 11 people um, hanging on in here. I really enjoyed speaking with you this evening um, and please do um, use our website to find out more, get in touch, come along to some of our other events um, and most amazingly have a super lovely um, and very safe evening. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Have a great night.